perk up. It's time to grab your board, swim out into the sea of ideas, and see if we can't catch a big wave of those pipelines starting to curl up on the horizon there. And we're also trying to make sure we don't catch anything else these days with Matt Hines. <laughs> it's a crazy yeah. world out there. I'm telling how about you. That segue. Yeah. Uh, how how you doing, Paul? Are you holding up? You uh, are you quarantined? Are you? I'm, uh... I'm hunkered down. I'm in the bunker here. Uh, no one can find me. No one can get to me here. This coronavirus has got everybody kind of uh, spooked a little bit here. What a strange, what a strange, different week this has been. I mean, it feels like, and, and really, I feel like when we were doing this last week. It was this wasn't on my mind at all. I mean, it was in the news, but it seemed very far away. Right. I spent the beginning of this week on the East Coast on Monday. I flew to Atlanta. We did a did a couple CMO events uh, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday morning in Atlanta and D.C. Things seem fairly business as usual, except for the fact, um, you know, you turn on the news. You know, I'm sitting at the hotel bar catching up and you look up on the news and there's there's national news people standing in front of a nursing home that is in my hometown. I live in Kirkland, Washington. Oh my goodness, I didn't realize that. Oh my. Um, so, Yikes. you know, we are I hate to use the word epicenter, but like you're there. freaking out. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, it's a really really big deal. So, it's very surreal to see that. I'll give Go you ahead. a different uh, take on it here too. So, we're in Southern California, which they thought yeah. would be ground zero, and we had a couple of cases in Northern California and a couple of deaths. Um, and but so far so good. You know, it's uh, they've had I don't know one or two cases in Orange County and one or two in uh, L.A. County, but it's uh, in San Diego. I don't know as reported, any, but they thought because of our tie to China and the Pacific Rim trade that we do, that we would be the first places this would hit. They didn't expect Kirkland. Washington or some of these other places that's hitting here. So I think that threw people for a loop. And here I can just tell locally, it's a tale of two cities. To quote Charles Dickens, we like to use uh, old uh, literary references sometimes here. It is a tale of two cities. Uh, uh, On the one hand, San Diego, Orange County, and L.A. County this week have all declared emergencies. Yeah. Wow, that wakes you up. And yet they're doing that as preparation to open up money and get people start thinking about it. So is it an emergency or is it a potential emergency? That's what we're all trying to evaluate here. And then what are the contingencies if it does turn into an emergency? They're asking people to stay at home and cancel events and whatnot. Do we have enough hospital beds? Do we have enough resources to take care of what could be a flood of people or what is hoped is not going to happen. I, I don't know. On the one hand, we're walking around like nothing's happened, and I hear people saying, oh, it's just overblown and it's no big deal. And then on the other hand, they've declared emergencies. How do you reconcile those two things? I don't know. You know, it's interesting is, you know, we are recording this on a Thursday at 1130 Pacific like we normally do. Right. And I know we have some people that are listening live. This is all happening to all of us real time, Thursday, March 5th. There are people that will probably hear this on the podcast, which probably won't be up for a couple of days. And as fast as things have moved, I mean, who knows what things are going to look like in a couple days sitting here a week ago it's in the news but it doesn't feel like it's personally affecting us now yes even just this work week many of the typical spring marketing and sales conferences that a lot of people count on going to that are kind of a mainstay of the counter i mean they're gone mm-hmm. i mean the what used to be the marketo summits which is now part of a domi's event which is like twenty thousand people Cancel. There are three events by vendors that have become big parts of the uh, the trade show schedule that are that are just gone now And look, I mean, practicing with an abundance of caution right now, I think is absolutely the right thing to do. Nobody wants to exacerbate a problem that may or may not sort of present itself anyway. Particularly if there have been deaths involved. I mean, this is not – on the one hand, it's a really bad case of the flu apparently. But it can get out of control, go into your lungs, and for those who are older or have other or younger or just unlucky – Apparently, it can turn into a deadly thing, and we don't know how many and what percentage. It seems to be a small percentage, but any percentage is significant. This is potentially. It doesn't matter. I mean, mean, if if people are dying, you got to take it seriously. And and I, you know, one more, you know, quick comment. I want to kind of slightly transition the conversation. Is the flu flu kills people every year? Yeah, we don't realize Um, that. So you don't want to take that lightly either. I think part of what I've seen, and I think Bill Gates had, if you you haven't read it yet, he had a really good blog post about this over the weekend, where he says, "Listen, like, you mean we don't." Don't have a cure for the flu for the just the normal annual right. influenza this is an opportunity for us to get our arms around a different version of the flu that we don't want to become the same thing we can't afford to have multiple versions of the flu that we can't solve for that every year 
come back and every year kill more people. And this is an opportunity for us to nip it in the bud. And I think it's an opportunity for us to prepare for things we don't often want to think about. The hidden boogeyman in the dark, the next big pandemic or something that we think, well, yeah, that's I got I got forever to plan for that. Even here, look, we're doing this show remotely, but we have a lot of people come in. I'm saying, hey, if you don't feel like coming in, don't come in. Businesses, I see people we had to show host today. She was working for GM. She's working at home today here. More and more people are just taking that precaution and trying to have something, some plan in place. Should this get worse or should this ever recur? Something like this. It's certainly a good time to take pause and just reflect on what's important and reflect on sort of making sure that you're prioritizing what's most important. You did a blog yeah. post today, and I know that you want to talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I did. So. And so I think I feel very fortunate that I think a lot of our listeners and certainly us at Heinz Mark, we work in a profession that has a lot more flexibility of time and place than a lot of other people do. I was hyper aware over the last three days of people I came in contact with while traveling that don't have that flexibility. A conference gets canceled that 20,000 people are no longer going to go to Vegas to. And technically, the content can be delivered online. It can be the formats like this and podcasts and webinars. Right. But then what about the shoeshine guy at the Mandalay Bay? Yeah. What about... Parking what attendant. About, yeah. What about the barista at the airport? I was hyper aware the last few days of all the professionals, mm-hmm. all the people, all the tradesmen and women that are doing their job. And they have to be to the airport to do it. They have to be at the casino to do it. They have to. They have to go to work. So, A, I am humbled and hyper aware of how lucky I am to have a job that has more of that flexibility. I'm also hyper aware of the impact all of this could be. Like if all of these camp conferences are canceled and people rely on those for their income, even a short amount of time could have a pretty dramatic effect. But the pivot I want to make and what we wrote about this morning, think about this. So, you know, these conferences getting canceled, we're doing this under abundance of caution. And a lot of people that would have been there can now work for home. But... There was a reason we were all going to go to this conference in the first place, Yeah, right? There's a reason why people were putting them on. you got companies like Adobe and Outreach and DevanBase and others that were doing these conferences. They were producing these conferences to get their community, their tribe together, right? And And I think about how long it took us to get back to this conference mentality after the Great Recession. You know, it was so many were canceled again for security or different kinds of security reasons. And it took us a while to sort of get back to... You've talked about it. Are conferences out or are conferences in? No, there's a place for them. And we've kind of gotten back to conferences on a normal schedule. I don't know what this does just for this term or this year, but does it disrupt it going forward again? Well, I think the question we tried to address this morning is, I think a lot of people see value in those events. Like if it weren't for this virus, all of those events would still go on. Sure, People would go. People would be happy they went. People would see it was successful. What has changed is not the value of the event. What has changed is the venue. Right. We no longer have that event in Las Vegas in three weeks as a channel, but the value people wanted out of it still exists. And so for me, like part of what I was thinking about, okay, now we have all of a sudden we have a level playing field for attendees, for sponsors, for marketers, for suppliers, for producers of events. And so where normally people would look at that and say, okay, they would, I think about this in terms of incremental versus exponential thinking. Normally, people would look at this saying, okay, well, everybody's going to the show. All of our, you know, we have to be there because everyone's be there. We have to be there because our competitors are there. So the incremental thinking is, how do we make our booth better this year? Like, how do we get more people to stop by our party? How do we stand apart from our competitors? That's incremental thinking, which you can apply in a lot of different capacities. Exponential thinking is... What if we just didn't go? Yeah. What if we didn't follow the crowd? What if we didn't do what everyone else did? What if we just didn't do events at all? How do we replace the value we need in our business somewhere else? So now this little coronavirus has forced our hand, Mm -hmm. right? Now those conferences don't exist, so you're not going to I mean you don't have a choice to go or not go. You're just not you're not yeah. you're not going to go. Right. So but the people that want to do attend are missing out on something. The people that wanted to sponsor are missing out on something. The people that produce the conference are going to miss out on something. So what was that and how did you now use that? I the last thing I want anyone to do is think about this as an opportunity. I hate, I'm, I've been really trying not to use that word this right. week because this is no one should be opportunistic when lives. But you got to be able state. to pivot quickly when the when market conditions change. I mean that's well, just a fact, right? It, yeah. So, so I think it, it, this is a forcing function to exercise some exponential thinking that says if we can no longer do this, what do we do? 
these companies that right now it, it's interesting i was this morning looking through the sponsor lists of the events that have been canceled and most of these i mean this is this is we're, we're 48 hours after all this happened right. so a lot of these conferences their websites are still up their sponsor lists are still up and the money's and, already and been spent they they already bought the booth they already uh you know bought the materials they, a lot of that is not refundable they may oh, put it in the closet sunk costs all over the place yeah. right so that and that's an issue in and of itself but there's money that was not spent that is that is already been recovered by not going right there's right. the travel costs the hotel food the, yeah lodging there, yes, there is effort that is still let, let alone you now have your time back, right? Oh, like you're not yeah. going to have people on the road. You're not going to spend the next couple of weeks continuing to prepare for that. So what's so, your guess? Do you think people are going to just rest and reset and sort of wait and do nothing? Or are some going to say, well, we got to do something. We've now got time. We've got our, maybe a different uh, priority. We can't go there. So what do we do instead? Or do they do nothing? Well, it depends on the audience. For the people that were organizing events, for the people that were planning on producing the events, the most common response I have seen is, we are going to do a virtual event. Mm -hmm. We are going to take all of that learning in person. We're going to do that online. Even here, there's one school district as of last night, uh, north of Seattle, that said they're closed now for two weeks. And they are now making online learning platforms available. They're taking curriculum and making that available online. So they're trying to replace some of that. From a legal standpoint, the state's still going to require 180 days of school. Yeah, right. But, but, but So if you're an organizer, you're saying, listen, I'm doing an event. I'll just do it online. I don't think that actually replaces what attendees want. No. And, and I know we've got to take a break here in a second, but here's my point. If I'm an attendee of a conference and there's 20,000 people at the conference, I am not going for your content. Because if I go for the content, I'm sitting in the back of a conference room. I can't see the stage. <laughs> I'm watching the general session on a video screen anyway as I sit in the back of the conference. I could do that from home. I could do that from my office. So I don't go to that conference for the content. That's a scary the thought. All the, all the effort they put into that conference con doesn't necessarily give me what I want. I went maybe because – of an opportunity to learn, yes, but also to network with my peers, to meet with them in person, to benefit from parallel thinking from other organizations. Like, so I think if you think about this as an organizer, if you think about this as a sponsor of events, if you think about this as an attendee in event, what exactly are they getting out of it? What exactly are they going there for? And I just give a tease before we go to commercial break. For all those companies that are thinking about this as let's just do the content online, if your attendees really, if what they really want isn't just the content, but they want the community, what if you took those same resources and created small micro versions of your event? What mm -hmm. if you use this as a way to catalyze actually creating and activating those local user groups to help your customers, to help people in your community get together in person? And there's a thousand ways you could actually do that. But in the past, when you've just said, well, we'll just go to the regular trade show and just do it all at once, it feels more efficient. Now a virus has forced your hand, but you got to think about where is that value exchange? What is actually valued in that process along the way? As you can tell, Paul, I've been thinking a lot about this. Yeah. We've been having a ton of conversations with companies this week about it. When we come back from break, I want to give some examples. Okay. Uh, it's one thing to say, say, okay, like here's the opportunity. I want to give some examples of what this could look like. We've got to take a quick break. Very different special episode today. For B2B practitioners using ABM to drive more reliable revenue for their business. How are these modern marketers adopting new tactics, overcoming obstacles, and achieving their goals? Read the new research report from Flip My Funnel and Heinz Marketing on the 2018 State of Account-Based Marketing and discover what's changed, what stayed the same, and where ABM is heading in the future. Visit HeinzMarketing.com's resource section. That's H-E-I-N-Z Marketing.com and the resource tab for your free copy today. How to Overcome Obstacles. That's what we're talking about today with Matt Hines on a very serious episode, one that we're all going to look back later and wonder if we want to get a snapshot of what we were thinking or how we were feeling, or maybe this is the moment something changed in the way we do business. We're talking with Matt Hines about the coronavirus and all the changes and obstacles have been thrown up as conferences have been closed. I'll make one point that I think you uh, were alluding to. I don't think we think too often about the value of these conferences. We just go because we've always gone and everybody goes and we see some value to it. We get some business. We can justify it. There's some ROI to it, but we don't think about why we go. And I think why we go is that press the flesh. And if suddenly pressing the flesh is frightening, that puts everything, 
that puts everything in a different perspective here. It does. You know, you got some natural forces that have sort of forced our hand into, into sort of thinking more broadly. It's amazing. We've been this week. I was in Atlanta and Washington D.C. for the fifth and sixth leg of a CMO breakfast series we've been doing with with Six Sense a partner. And part of what we've been doing is, you know, they did a conference in in uh, December that was called Breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And so we said, okay, like, let's 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 help people do some breakthrough thinking. And so their their language, which I think worked really well, is like, how do you create breakthrough thinking in your organization to do something special, unique, and better? And so the language I've been using is really more around sort of this incremental versus exponential thinking. And until this week, the breakfasts we've been doing, like the scenario we've given people has been around generating leads. The incremental thinking is how do we get more people to respond to our emails? How do we get more people to fill out our landing page forms? The exponential question is, what if we eliminated leads altogether? Yeah. What if you joined a new company and you're running marketing? And what if your new CEO, what if she came to you on the first day and says, I am eliminating MQLs. I'm eliminating marketing qualified leads from our model, from our lexicon. I don't believe in it. I think they're counterproductive. Now what do you do? Yeah, right. Right. And so that's the conversation in, in that we're going to have. A new organization and a new leader. She's the forcing function to make do that. Yesterday in D.C., we decided to just do an immediate pivot. So let, let's make the exponential breakthrough question what if you decided not to do trade shows this yeah, year? Yeah, exactly. Which all of a sudden is a real question <laughs> because I mentioned earlier all these different sponsor lists. There are companies that are on every one of these lists that are in that are heavily invested in trade shows this year as part of their budget, as part of where their team is focused, as part of where they're expecting their marketing ROI to come from. It's gone. So what do you do, right? So here's some examples of some things that I've been thinking about, like just based on conversations with clients that are struggling with this, that are losing sleep over this as suppliers, as sponsors, as um, producers of these events, like could some of those trade show resources that you just always feel like you've had to to devote there, could those be redeployed into other channels, into digital prospect experiences, into sales enablement efforts to help your field sales directly connect and have those direct conversations with people? Could you convert a mass scale event into local in-market events that may be smaller but could have a more direct lasting impact on your target account? Like, could you, I mentioned earlier before we left, like, could you organize your customers and industry community into local user groups to replicate part of the community building that's happening at large events that may have been lost? Perhaps those actually end up including eventually a sort of an online community. Maybe it starts as people are like, especially in Seattle, if you're saying, listen, for March, I'm not going anywhere. Start it with an online community. Start it with a Slack channel. Mm -hmm. Start it with some other format that is sponsored and maybe even underwritten by your firm. It may very well be led by a member of the community. It could be a peer-to-peer -peer organization at a local level where you as the sponsor, where you as the provider of tools that that community uses is giving them guidance and resources and donuts and whatever else they need to do it. You know how you're in a relationship and you're like, this is fine and you justify everything. And then all of a sudden you're out of the relationship. You're like, well, I'm really glad that's gone because that didn't work as well as I thought it did, right? <laughs> and so like, if you think about a trade show and you think you got your booth and you're doing badge scans, well, it, you're just counting on the random person coming by your booth and hoping that the right person or the right person comes by. And so that person in a complex buying process is one member of many in the buying committee. There's usually an arbitrary definition or response to are they qualified? Like, should we follow up with them? Are they a sales lead? So the usual random badge scans with the subjective are they qualified guessing – could be converted into an investment in actual intelligence, actual intent data on the broader account and buying committee, not just who stopped by the booth. I don't expect in this show and in the, maybe in the five minutes we have left here, we're going to have the answers. But I guess what I want to do, what I wanted to do with the blog post I want to do here as well is nature has forced our hand. We got to figure out how to keep our community safe and keep ourselves safe. That's the immediate top priority. Absolutely. But we also still have to run a business. We still have to generate results. We still have to create value for our audience. And whether your new CEO tells you MQLs no longer exist or whether a virus tells you your trade show sales are no longer exists, what would you do differently? The other piece of this that I've, related to exponential thinking, I see some companies in their all hands meetings will proactively develop these scenarios that can sometimes feel theoretical, but I'll guarantee you, some, if, if I told you to create a list of theoretical things for us, a, what, a list of what ifs for us to practice some exponential thinking, if four months ago you would have done that, one of those it'll never happen, but what if scenarios might have been, what if a global pandemic yeah. cancels all group gatherings? Right. So it's like war gaming almost. You know, that's what they do in, uh, in the military, in the Pentagon all the time, these what if scenarios, and they run them through and they try and come up with some idea of what could we do. I know this will never happen, but what if 
XYZ Martians landed and, you know, we had to do this or something more practical than that. I don't think businesses run war games. I don't think we like what-if scenarios. We don't like uncertainties. We don't – that's too negative. I, I don't want to think about that. Somehow you're going to put – don't put that out in the universe. It might actually happen if you start thinking about it. I think that may be the ultimate – change that comes out of this we're going to have to prepare more for those what if scenarios we've seen two in my lifetime here in recent lifetime we never thought we'd see the great meltdown you know almost like the great depression that changed and scarred my father's uh, world war ii generation so deeply and changed the way they lived their whole lives and my dad would never have carry a credit card debt he always paid everything off he he was always afraid of the next collapse having been scarred by that as a kid and seeing people lined up in the streets. I think our children have been scarred by the watching us suffer through the Great Recession. Many were saying, screw it, I'm not going to have a house. Too many people lost their houses. I'm going to do something different, or I'm not going to put the priority in the house. So you you think, well, that's a a black swan event. Never happen again. Once in a lifetime. We're seeing too many once in a lifetime things. I think we got to start playing these what-if scenarios, even if we don't like thinking about them. And the advantage of having those hypothetical conversations is that even if that never happens, like even if a global pandemic didn't shut down all the events, even if, I mean, another scenario sometimes we'll say is like, you know, your CEO may ban MQLs or privacy laws may ban unsolicited email. A lot of people think unsolicited email in the U.S., you can still send it as long as you put an unsubscribe link, right? But it could be if the U.S. eventually nationally adopts European rules what 95% of B2B companies do may become illegal. Yeah, right. And if that were to happen, what would you do? And so you have a couple choices. You can think about that now and figure out how would you react to that and what are those things should you put in place now? Or you can just wait until it happens. <laughs> right. And try and figure it out. And then well, have to scramble. So I'll give you a right? couple other examples of the kind of what-if scenarios we live in. I live in Southern California, you know, the big one, the earthquake. It's been predicted since I was a little kid. And yet most of and some of us have a little bit. We try and have some water emergency kit. But most of us, I don't think, are really that prepared. We are building-wise. We've changed our building codes dramatically. But in terms of your business operation, what if tomorrow you couldn't get to work? What if your business is shut down for a week, for longer, the building collapse, something like that? I think we just play chicken little. We, we stick our head in the sand and we say, I hope, I hope, I hope. I don't want to think about that. Or worse things, electromagnetic pulse hits and knocks out all the communication satellites or knocks out the internet or the grid goes down for a week or your site goes down for a week. I think maybe big businesses do little fry. I don't think we worry about that or give it the thought it needs to be. And maybe that's what'll change when we hit enough of these pandemics, meltdowns, problems once in a lifetime, we start thinking maybe we got to play war games. Maybe we got to think through these what ifs more often. Well, and I do think there's a difference between contingency planning and exponential thinking. When I was I was at a startup, we were going public and we were writing the prospectus. And, you know, my CEO, I've known him for years. We worked at Microsoft together and we were joking about like how many contingencies you have to put into (laughs) a prospectus. The joke I'll always remember him saying, he's like, it really, he said, it really does get a little serious. He's like, you have to tell your investors about all the things that could impact your business. And his joke was, he said, if the earth all of a sudden is devoid of oxygen, (laughs) that would impact our ability to do business. I'm sort of getting into all these. This isn't about creating an exhaustive list of all the things that could happen. I remember there was an SNL skit years ago, too. It was it was um, it was someone playing Tom Brokaw Mm -hmm. and he wanted to go on vacation. And so they that the skit was they made him read all of the headlines that could possibly happen (laughs) and just record them. The lesson is that I think to occasionally think outside the box, to think, to force yourself to think if certain known expectations were gone, if certain things you relied on, certain things you took for granted, if certain things in the status quo were no longer relevant, were no longer there, were no longer important, how would that change what you do business? And the answer to that question, maybe it wouldn't change anything. But if the answer is that I would try something different, I would try I would change the way I do it. Why wouldn't you think about doing that now? You can't get outside the box until they take the box away. And then then you're forced to do something. And that's, you know, it's safe for us to continue to stay in the box, be where we are. Right. Right. But and so I think that's it's an opportunity we always have. It's made me think about the last week or so at all. Listen, I know we're out of time. No matter when you're listening to this, whether you're listening to this live, you're listening to this on the podcast or hell, you might be listening to us a year from now. Stay safe. Hug your kids. Tell people in your family and your friends. Tell them that you care about them, that you love them, and what they mean to you. Prioritize yourself. 
your safety or family safety. Um, but it gives us lots of things of food for thought as well. Well, Paul, this has been fun. I appreciate you being able to pivot for us. I wanted to have this conversation anyway. We had a last minute guest cancellation this morning. So it was a great opportunity to replace uh, the content we had planned for today. Thank you everyone for listening today. I know we're out of time for my great producer, Paul. This is Matt Hines. Thank you for listening to another episode of sales pipeline radio. And with that, we wrap up another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio right here on the Funnel Radio channel for at-work listeners like you.